All right. So I think we're recording. Uh, go ahead, Liz. This is looks like another social engineering trick here. Yeah, so uh, I thought this was actually a pretty darn uh, funny and entertaining story. Um, it, it's uh, the, these hackers uh, managed to uh, comp to grab some uh, startup money, um, and and I think that this is uh, this makes a lot of sense because you you hit the big transaction right. So this company was getting like a a million dollars in VC money, mm. and. Uh, they intercepted it in between, and it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, interesting because all they had to do to steal this million dollars was essentially uh, compromise an email account. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think I think that this is a pretty uh, I think this is a pretty interesting uh, this mm. is a pretty interesting attack. <laughs> I know. I looked at it. They they spoofed the email domain, so I guess they modify emails to just refer to the wrong domain. Yeah. Well, and even better, uh, you know, always return to the scene of the crime. You'd think they'd take their million dollars and run, but they didn't. They're oh. uh, actually still harassing the CFO every month with more demands for uh, wire transfers. Oh, kind of like, like the they think they're going to get more. Oh. Uh, probably, I'm, hopefully, not, hopefully they're not that stupid. I don't think so, but yeah. uh, I mean that's pretty that's pretty bold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looked like they used the spoof emails and then emailed back to the real ones to keep the the whole line going to get that million dollars. Yep. Well, you know, it reminds me of the one where they have uh, they were talking about Trump using all these insecure cell phones to discuss national security matters. A bunch of people just don't think about the security of their transmission lines. Like, they should right. really can't believe anything you get in an email, and you can't believe anything you see on Facebook. Anyway, it's... Uh, it's crazy how uh, effective phishing campaigns still are. I just read a, another article about that. I mean, it's, you know, for all the training we're doing, uh, it's still really successful. So there's yeah. a lot to be done. Right. Yeah. I mean, the training is just not effective. That too, I think a lot of the time. Here's a, a summary of the decade. What do you got here, Evan? Oh, that's yeah, so a good article. I saw that yeah, one. One of those many articles that are coming out uh, as the year is ending about making predictions for 2020 and the decade. Uh, some of the things that, that this article talks about is how deep fakes are going to be more common. So you're, we're talking about uh, training people for phishing. Well, uh, training them to to catch a deep fake video versus the phone call versus you know, emails, uh, Internet of Things being something that's just ever increasing, uh, ransomware as well. I have another article on ransomware, uh, but just having having more areas for IT departments to watch over, and of course humans making things more complicated every year. Yeah, I thought it said something in this article somewhere, too, about how instead of just sending an email, now you're going to have to contend with uh, essentially a video of your, your CEO asking for money. That's yeah. uh, a total deep fake. <laughs> yeah, so how do you identify uh, the real versus fake? Yeah, I would think the most direct application would be in politics, and that's already started where you have gangs like uh, Trump and his gang that make up lies about people. Now they can make up fake evidence to report the fake lies about people. Yeah. Though this also seems like a super effective way to steal a million dollars in VC money. <laughs> it might be, yes. I think it would help. And I, I put a podcast in here because I thought it was very interesting. I heard it early this morning. Um, this is Malware Jake on Twitter, and I've met this guy because he and I have pictures for a while that look very much alike, but he was an NSA cyber warrior, and when the shadow brokers dumped out their stuff, he was the first guy to say when they indicted them. Maybe they had the U.S. government indicted 11 Russian military to be punished for doing Russian military operations against us, and Jake jumped up and said, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. I don't think I want uh, on-duty military being hit with uh, lawsuits for obeying their orders. How can you do that? And the reason he said that, which came out later, is that he was in the NSA, and that was dumped by them to punish him. He was. He pointed out 
she, they pretended that to be an independent group leaking out the NSA stolen tools for money, but it was the Russian military. And it was a psychological operations campaign. And he observed that it was carefully timed around major events um, and often commenting on things that Biden and other people in high positions had done. And so they punished him. They outed him as an NSA cyber warrior, which had been a secret. And he actually had to like cancel his foreign trips and kind of hide because he was worried that he was going to be hurt by them or by um, right wingers who would see him as now uh, disloyal to Trump or something. So it was really very interesting. Hmm. And um, it, it gets, it's more, a lot of background for the stuff that I've seen happen, but I didn't know enough about. But um, the NSA has been hacking everybody and they've been keeping it secret. And the Russians have been hacking him back. This is also, I think, related to the election meddling. You know, this is how it works. And, you know, I was involved in a bit of this back in 2011 and 2012. And the gesture was there saying, we're developing this military activity of psyops where you embarrass people and manipulate their politics with these cyber attacks. And I was pretty skeptical about that part of it, but obviously it was really going on and it's still going on. And it's like, you know, we pretend the Russians influenced our election, but we're totally doing it to other people. I think we set the standard for a lot of this stuff. But anyway, it's, um, it's very interesting to see. Anyway, and he's now a SANS instructor. And he's a very big guy on Twitter, has a lot of good commentary on the uh, latest attacks and all the uh, political implications of it all. So that was my thing. And here you got high schools. Yeah. Hacking uh, high schools, actually. Yeah. What kind of thought, scary? I thought this was pretty interesting, especially considering that it's in uh, Arkansas, of all places. They're actually taking this seriously and... Uh, they're um, basing their their curriculum on a, on a, uh, a university cybersecurity curriculum, and uh, they're starting to um, train their high schoolers. So I mean, that's that's definitely a a step in the right direction. And they're using a, a range. Yeah, but what I don't see here is whether it's attack or defense. I'm going to um, guess defense. Yeah, well, and who knows? It might be a combo of both. Um, you know, I, that may, I think that, I actually think that that's becoming um, less of a stigma than it even was like two or five years ago. Um, and I think part of that is uh, that we're getting buy-in from the federal government for this stuff, like the Pentagon, the DOD, all those are, Department of Energy, they're all holding these hackathons now. And um, I think that's that's kind of helping to, you know, lessen the immediate like reflex reaction like, oh, God, you can't teach the, you can't teach these kids how to do nefarious things with computers. And and you're just going to be creating criminals, which has always been kind of the reflex uh, reaction that we've gotten from the public. So um, either way, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like this crowd at this conference, they they're probably still there. Yeah. With that jerk reaction, I don't think they they've gotten to that point of thinking beyond. Uh, but good to see that that a state is jumping forward. Yeah, and it's cool. They're talking about um, they're talking about doing sort of what we do, where um, they uh want to offer a summer camp for the yeah. students to learn that stuff. So That's certainly good. The one we've been doing, the cyber camp. Yeah. I, know, um, I also saw about six months ago, the Girl Scouts are now teaching lock picking. Yeah. So that's good, clean fun. Yep. Yeah. They, they actually have a cybersecurity badge now, which is pretty cool. And up till about a year ago, for a couple of years, they had all these awesome tweets from, on cybersecurity from Teen Vogue. I, yeah, I lately, but for a couple of years, Teen Vogue was real big in cybersecurity. Yeah, I'm actually really glad to see Girl Scouts getting back to teaching useful stuff because, um, you know, when I was a kid, I was in it and we learned some pretty useful things. Um, but for a while there, uh, you know, during the early 2000s, it was what my friend referred to as Stepford Scouts because it was like, you know, how to go shopping at the mall and how to put on makeup and stuff. So, uh, which is pretty, pretty, pretty uh, crappy. So I'm, I'm really glad to see them getting back to actually teaching, um, teaching some useful things. Yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, they called that home ec. 
<laughs> but home ec, you know, home ec is, should teach you some useful things too, like how to cook stuff and, you know, various domestic arts. That was supposedly what he did, yeah. Hey, Irving, you got this stuff that goes into safe mode. Yeah, there's this ransomware who who reboots your PC into safe mode, so obviously it has to be Windows, uh, boots it into safe mode, and, and then starts infecting the system. Since in safe mode, most of the defenses are down you know, for yeah. troubleshooting reasons. So they, they took that and said, you know, we can, we can run with this. I thought the whole point of safe mode is that most stuff wouldn't run in safe mode. How do you automatically right. launch stuff in safe mode? Uh, they probably are using the the very basics, uh, you know, the very basic stuff that you do have available, but you still can read and write the files in safe mode. Yeah, I just I thought the whole point was it would stop automatically starting things, like your malware. They must have been clever about how they launch it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe like a like a scheduled task or something. I don't think they run in safe mode, but it'd have to be something like that. They'd have to find something that still runs in safe mode. Uh, you know what? They probably just stick it in registry. They could, too. Yeah, if they could mimic a service. That would have got, yeah, you'd have to add them to one of the services that still runs in safe mode, I guess. Yeah, anyway, that's that's yeah. a good trick. Yeah, there's, some, there's some pictures further down, as you see, where like they're they're adding yeah, they're adding a service. Oh, they, they tell you? Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, there's a picture further down in the article. Ah. Oh, yeah. Oh. They set yeah, up so a one-off Windows service. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Good. Well, that's a thing to know. It's a good one. Oh, yeah. Now I got one of mine. I, I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, I, I taught computer forensics, and I learned something about forensics, and forensics is pretty bogus. I mean, many, many, many scandals where they prove that the techniques they've been using for decades are in complete garbage, like hair matching and stuff. And they and this is another one. Cops have been using this thing where you um, there were. I went to DEF CON and they had a talk on neuro linguistic programming, which is something a lot of cops were using for a long time. Where you just sort of look at the words people use and decide that's a visual word, so that means you're this kind of thinker. You look to the left, that means you're lying. And here's another version of the same thing. He said this works best if the people doing it have no knowledge of the case and it always finds the bad guy right away. And you completely ignore everything about the case. You have them write a page, a few pages of what happened, and you just pick out the words. Like certain kinds of words are yellow, and other kinds of words are blue. And if it's more yellow than blue, they're guilty. And if it's more blue, they're innocent, or something like that. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are paying for this stuff and getting trained in it and using it. And they did some scientific tests, and it's no better than random. But anyway, uh, this keeps happening. Reminds me of there was a movie, The Men Who Stare at Goats. There's all these military campaigns to harness psychic powers and stuff. And there was psychometry and there's Scientology. There's this an end of this bunk, no end of this bunk science that people will fall for loosely based on some kind of psychology. They can somehow tell who's lying. I've heard people talk about analyzing videos and somehow deciding if you're lying and stuff. It never seems to go too far. It's interesting that that article has a link to a, uh, some kind of to to an article regarding my hometown up at the top who is famous for doing shit like this um and, yeah uh oh i think that's our i think that actually is a local case it looks like it is yeah that's from where where i'm from no wonder yeah they're famous for doing shit like this um yeah, well apparently it's a good scam they've got a bunch of people basically joining this religion well, and and it goes the other way too. Uh, you know, I worked in the um, I and I worked in the prosecutor's office in that county for four years, and um, you know, an ongoing problem was uh, the cops collecting and and mishandling evidence. Like they would bungle stuff all the time. So then, um, you know, not only were innocent people going to jail that shouldn't have been, but also criminals were going free on cases because. Um, they would basically hose the, they would hose the prosecutor's case by, through their, their, uh, you know, not observing like chain of custody and stuff like that. Yeah. I know how often they lose papers at the college and I think they, uh, they lose evidence in a lot of places as easily. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm in government work, so I know how lousy it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
So you've got uh, Google watching you, more spying? Yeah, yeah, you know, no surprise to anyone, right? Yeah, Google's, Google's collecting uh, lots of info on us. But I thought this was interesting in that, um, you know, two of the salient points from this article, one was that they uh, essentially scan the email messages in your inbox and then um, use that to uh, contribute to a profile that they have on you of uh, everything you've ever bought. Um, and uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is they also do this for um, educational accounts. So like all of our school email accounts that are that run off Gmail, yeah. they do this thing through there. And um, <laughs> in that case, it's interesting because I'm not sure that there's anything in the user agreement that, uh, you know, our students uh, agree to that when they sign I, up. I was part of that debate like 10 years ago. Our emails, about 14 years ago, our email servers crashed and they lost everybody's email. And it turned out that the C drive just got full and nobody noticed you did anything about it. And there was no backup. And they spent like weeks trying to like find a, uh, a rec recovery, which never worked. And then about two years later, I was teaching a summer course and my students needed logins. They said, well, your students can't have logins because we ran out of email accounts and we can't add any more. And that's when I said, you know, we should just use Gmail because obviously we're incompetent to run email servers here. And then people said, oh, they invade their privacy. And I said, oh, who cares about that? We need service that works. Let's just do it. And that's well, the, I mean, you're that's not wrong. That won. What? You're not wrong. I mean, you do need service that works. And what, what, you know, it definitely takes a lot of the overhead off of institutions to have Gmail running that stuff. Um, and I mean, every, every school I've ever been to uh, uses it, but it's, it's interesting, you know, it's just interesting the uh, amount of data they amass that way. And it's not just colleges, but also uh, elementary, middle and high schools use it too. Um, but the other thing that I thought was interesting in this article is that they uh, actually have uh, agreements with major credit card companies. Um, like one of them was MasterCard, where they uh, buy up all the uh, credit card data. So it's not just stuff, it's not just your online transactions, but your offline transactions uh, yeah. come into play here. I started uh, using also, Apple Pay, and it does send an email every time I buy something. Yeah. So I guess like even a pack of that. gum or something. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was seeing a podcast or something or talking. They were saying, you know, every time you sign in with your loyalty card, they find out who you are. But, you know, for like eight, eight years ago at DEF CON, they said, just type in the Microsoft main contact number. I've been using that as my loyalty card for years. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not that's as personal as they think. <laughs> That's pretty good. I have like a stack of Safeway cards that I've never put any info in on at all. <laughs> I know. But, I mean, I don't know. I think this is interesting. Yeah, nothing you do online is private. I just default to that. But it's also interesting to see um, the new and, and novel ways that they're building uh, dossiers on all of us. Right. Yeah, now the it, reflex action, every time someone asks me for my email, I try a whole series of fake email providers, and usually uh -huh. one of them is accepted. I mostly just do it because I'm thinking I might want to make another account and get another free trial or something later. Um, you know, and one, one point in this article that I thought was interesting, you know, it might seem kind of far-fetched, but I really don't think it is, but uh, one theorist uh, made a remark about how this could eventually be used for uh, price fixing and price gouging because you know you could just use an uh, an algorithm to figure out what the customer will pay or can pay and then charge them that price. Well, I know Amazon already does that. They Do use, they? They use your IP address and your zip code, and if you use a VPN, you'll see a different price for the same product. Really? Oh yeah, that yes. came out a couple of years ago. Oh wow! Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. That's cool. I did that by accident, just playing around with it. Yeah. And yes, yeah. And I, I wasn't using a VPN. I was using Tor as just, yeah. just for kicks and giggles on yeah. uh, Firefox. And yeah, it's true. It gives you two different prices. Yeah. Which one was which one was the better price? 
the better price, at least for the, the thing that I was just playing around with, was the one that knew my account. Interesting. <laughs> at least that one, maybe, maybe a different item, like a, maybe like a large appliance, I'd be uh -huh. the other way around, but uh, which would make sense, you know, to get to get people instead of going to the Home Depot to buy something, go to Amazon to buy something. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, you know, you could actually make money. This is how a lot of the um, fast program transactions work. They just move closer to the stock exchange so they're one millisecond ahead. And you could like set up a bunch of proxy servers and buy Amazon stuff a little cheaper and shuttle it around or something. Yeah. 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 Anyway. All right. And I and we got this one here, birth certificates. Oh, yeah. Sounds like I'm probably on this list. Everybody's got a birth certificate in the last several years, right? Yep, yep. Again, uh, somebody put this information up on a AWS bucket and didn't properly protect it, so it's facing out to the world. Somebody saw it and said, hey, uh, your info's out. Wow, that just keeps happening. And as yeah. usual, it's a company you never heard of, and they don't answer the phone, and nobody really knows who they are or why they have the data, because I think everybody outsources everything. Not that I'd ever do that. And then they don't <laughs> even know who's handling their stuff. Yeah. Well, and, it's, uh, and do, they, do they even care? Because, you know, look what happened to Equifax. Nothing. Yeah. Well, I remember Kaiser. About 10 years ago, Kaiser got an email from somebody in, like, Pakistan saying, I'm going to dump your medical records if you don't send me $10. And you're like, what's this? And they'd hired a local company, which had then, without telling them, outsourced it to Pakistan and then not paid the people in Pakistan. They're like, what happened here? That's great. I think that happens a lot. You may not even know how many layers of hands your stuff is passing through. Right. That's great. Right. Anyway, um, and I've got the one here. Yeah, this, this I thought was a pretty good scam. I hadn't heard this particular one before, but it's pretty good. These guys have really cheap hosting, and they advertise right on, uh, like, the Friday after Thanksgiving, Black Friday, a special sale. So all these people sign up, and the next day they just cancel, leak, cut, shut down the business, leave, and keep the money. Like 20 of them. That seems pretty good. I think the 20 were named, but there's more. Yeah. There's but more than 20. I that's a real simple scam. It seems like that would work pretty well. Yeah. I remember I had a student one time that had a website on hostfor2bucks.com. And, uh, you know, it's, it didn't go down like this, but it was pretty bad hosting. And then a guy asked me to take my students to tour his data center because I'm running real internet business here. Your students could some see it. And it was one tiny little Windows NT 3.5 server under a sink with one cable and no antivirus. And he said he was hosting 100 websites and 50 businesses email server. And you don't need any antivirus or firewall or anything. That thing's been up for years and everything's fine. And, you know, I think right. that's what you get if you go to hostfor2bucks.com. You know, what's really going on at the other end? <laughs> Right. Anyway, yeah, well, that's, I guess that's it. Any more comments? What's even yeah. more amazing is that that guy invited you to bring a field trip of students to come view his data center. I know. <laughs> he was proud of this stuff. And I said, um, uh, gee, I, I, I don't think it'll fill on my schedule. You know, anyway. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to stop the recording.